I'm Jean Gray, founder and publisher of American Entrepreneurship Today, a website that brings news and valuable information to entrepreneurs, innovators, and investors all across America. Our podcast series, Experience Voices, explores the journeys of very successful people in the entrepreneurial arena who are open to sharing the key elements that led to their great success. Our guest today on Experience Voices is Jose Gomez, CEO and co-founder of Fluid Power AI. Jose and his two co-founders, his father Mario Gomez and Francis Taglia, founded the company in 2019. Working together, they received a patent for an AI-powered full-stack embedded solution that delivers plug-and-play intelligence to hydraulic power applications. As a first-time entrepreneur, Jose offers a great narrative of his funding experiences. He shares the ins and outs of pitching and how he engaged with the Angel Network and tapped into the resources of the Southern California entrepreneurial ecosystem. He raised $4 million of seed capital and then achieved even more, closing a strategic $4.8 million round with a large IoT player. Jose also has an inspiring story of how he was put on the path to become an entrepreneur and innovator. He was a seven-year-old immigrant from Mexico and later received an academic scholarship from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that enabled him to earn a mechanical engineering degree focusing on mechatronic systems from UC Berkeley. At Berkeley, he worked for Ford Motor Company as a hydraulic power steering quality engineer and at Berkeley Bionics developing hydraulic powered human exoskeletons. He spent 16 years in the industry developing embedded and automated systems for aerospace, defense, automotive, industrial, consumer product, and semiconductor applications. Jose, thanks for being our guest on Experience Voices. You have one of the more unique models that has received funding. Your venture targets industrial clients. Your technology platform uses AI. You co-founded the venture with your father, and each of you are highly skilled experts in hydraulics. And as a first-time entrepreneur, you adeptly navigated the funding space. Let's start by talking about your model and when you realized it was funding worthy. Was it during the planning stage or you went down the road a bit and came to the epiphany that the model would be attractive to investors? Yeah, great question. Uh, Gene, first of all, I appreciate you uh, having me on and uh, inviting me onto the show. Uh, Real privilege to be on here with you. And uh, it was great getting to know you actually uh, later last week. I really enjoyed that. I actually, I grew up in this space. And so I, I truly knew that this venture was fun and worthy when I was 16 and I was out there doing the work and experiencing the inefficiencies at every, you know, part of the industry there. And so, uh, you know, really off the bat, when we, when we decided to start our venture, we incubated at the Evo Nexus incubator here in, uh, La Jolla and, uh, started right off the bat, uh, raising angel, angel funding with a napkin sketch and a PowerPoint. Tell me a little bit about the, the, uh, the company, uh, what's your, uh, service or product and sure. who your target customers are. Yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, I like to say we provide and develop plug and play intelligence for, uh, some of the industries that, you know, need it the most, uh, in particular, it is, uh, the heavy industry focusing on anything that uses hydraulics. So your trash trucks, your concrete mixers, your cranes, your elevators, boats, you name it, are all driven and powered by these subsystems that wear. They're going to break down and you need your mechanics out there maintaining them and repairing them. And uh, what we've done is we've developed a hardware-enabled uh, uh, actionable insight model that allows us to deploy you know, our patented IP sensor cluster and intelligent system onto any one of these equipments and make it smart. So the, the truck or the, the crane or, or the equipment, the, the machine can actually 
you know, diagnose itself. It can call the operator and provide him the troubleshooting instructions on how to fix it. And when you, you know, deploy the AI aspect and what we have, you know, in terms of our communication capabilities over the last 25 years, you make it so that not only can you tell the operator, the maintenance, you know, technicians, what the problem is and how to fix it, but how about you order those parts for him and you, you know, place the POs and make it so that the actual maintenance is scheduled at the optimal time to reduce the downtime and, you know, maximize the, the, uh, uh, the operational efficiency of these, you know, equipments that really they run our world gene, right? We don't do anything if trash isn't picked up every day. Uh, we're not building emerging cities if, you know, we don't have concrete mixers out there. And so what we've done is um, we charge for the a hardware uh, activation fee, if you will, and then we charge a monthly subscription to our customers to provide them, you know, insight about the health and usage of their equipment but we also share that down through the uh, uh, the entire market, right? So uh, we partner with the OEMs and uh, they, uh, you know, subscribe to a monthly where we provide them the data about their equipment and how to design better equipment and how to provide their customers with the repair components. And so we really want to take it all the way there. Um, so at the highest level, this is a software, a hardware enable, you know, uh, SaaS model, if you will. Is it based on you bringing a, a cost savings to each client? Is you're able to substantiate that using your your uh, IP that they're going to be over time saving substantial amount of money? Is that how it starts? Absolutely. So, uh, great question, Gene. So, the idea is uh, first and foremost, it's you know if you can have predictive maintenance and you can know what piece of the system is wrong and you can adhere to it, you know, uh, before you have, you know, some failure in your system, um, you can greatly reduce the cost of ownership, mainly because you avoid the downtime. Anytime a factory injection molding machine or a trash truck is, is out of service, it costs a lot of money. And if it fails, you know, during operation, that downtime is where it takes a hit. You have to give you an idea the the big, you know, mining equipment, those trucks are doing, you know, $50,000 an hour of, of worth of material, right, in iron ore. Um, and so uh, reducing that is, is a huge aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect is that when something breaks and you've got this big machine and you have to know, how to fix it, just the time in ordering these parts and getting them shipped to you. It, you go through a lot of phone calls. It's an industry that still, you know, uses uh, uh, big catalogs, right? And in and, and a very fragmented supply chain. And so the idea is that not only are we going to save money because that piece of equipment is going to have you know, it, it, we're going to be able to maximize its operational efficiency. We are also going to be able to maximize the efficiency of, of the entire organization itself. You know, a, a place like waste management or, you know, a Rio Tinto. What you're explaining resonates with me. Uh, one of my prior companies and me being uh, more of an operations person and having conversations with manufacturers, injection molders for one, in which they explain very directly how important that any downtime be kept to a minimum. And um, especially this was covered in our setups. So I definitely understand where now your audience is or your customer base is and why they would value um, your, your, uh, your software. So let's start with the uh, part of getting out of the gate because you had already shared that you started to raise some uh, funding in your area. So you had to get to the prototype. So prototype and then funding, funding and then prototype. 
How's the proof of concept uh, put together for your company? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. And, you know, Francis and I, uh, we decided to, uh, you know, start a deep tech venture and and tackle this huge problem with the latest tech. Uh, But we we didn't have any money. And so we walked away. I I was uh, uh, working at Cymer ASML at the time doing managing all their automated test systems there. And um, we, we were doing contracting work for guys like Tesla, Dexcom, just building automated test systems on the side while we uh, filed for um, our provisional patent. So we, we conceptualized the proof of concept on paper, if you will. Uh, I, you know, I've got a lifetime of experience in this space and my dad's got two other lifetimes in it. And so I knew the issues very well and we've been working around the tech you know, deploying anything from embedded systems to self-driving algorithms to vision-based, you know, AI uh, uh, quality control systems. Um, And so, you know, once we filed for the provisional, we came down to my dad's hydraulic shop and we created a, you know, complex hydraulic system and we simulated all of the faults that we knew we had to do. So we proved to ourselves that the IP was right, that the math worked. Um, and so, uh, and then we could build a model. And so from there, uh, I was doing software development while Francis was building a PowerPoint to get us into an incubator. And uh, when we showed up, we, we pitched the president of the incubator, a guy named Marco Thompson. He is a fantastic individual. One of the, uh, has touched a lot of startups here in, in the San Diego area and was one of the founders at Evo Nexus. And uh, he was a president at the time and he gave us, I kid you not, it was 30 seconds. And he said, come back next week. I'll, you know, buy me lunch and you get to pitch me for 30 minutes and I'll give you a yes or no. It was, you know, and so he, uh, we bypassed the the application process. He got us into a due diligence and he got us in there with a guy named Michael Feynman. He was, um, he founded Feigl Thoppen, uh, was the creator of that, the uh, deep neural network algorithm that protects, you know, 2 billion credit card accounts. Uh, you know, it really used by uh, everyone now. Uh, and, you know, some of the best experts in AI embedded systems and after a two hour call, they gave us the thumbs up and they put us through, it was like three week program of how to raise money. And Marco told us, he said, you're going to have to build it before you raise it. And you're going to have to raise it while you build it. So, you know, you're going to be working at night, raising money during the day. And so he told us we needed a prototype and Francis and I developed a full working prototype in two weeks. And then he told us we had to have a customer. So a week after that, we had two systems installed with um, Edco here in San Diego on two front loading trash trucks. That was the uh, the market we we decided to go on. And um, and so from there, I think it cost us about seven thousand dollars to put that together. Just you know, uh, uh, two of them. And after that, it was off to the races, raising money on, on the provisional patent that we had and the proof of concept of a, of, of a prototype. The uh, customers that you used for your prototype, a lot of um, aspiring entrepreneurs um, struggle for the first adopter. Would you say that those who uh, you trialed with um, were pre-existing connections or the incubator facilitated that? But that's such a big step of taking the prototype and moving it into, you know, a a real test. Yeah, no, absolutely. And when we've been blessed with that, one of my co-founders happens to be my best friend and my father. Uh, You know, he and I have been been in the hydraulic industry for a very long time now. And he's, you know, really developed the reputation for the go-to guy. You know, he's been on offshore oil rigs, getting the OEM teams, you know, uh, troubleshooting issues resolved. And so uh, in San Diego, he's kind of revered as the guy who's got the solution. And, you know, I credit him with being the mastermind behind all of this because he, he really, uh, 
brainwashed me into loving this stuff early on. But, um, but, you know, he, he walked us into, you know, really all the customers. We had a system installed on a concrete mixer, an injection molding machine. Um, we really had our pick in terms of people who were looking for a solution. And what we found is that, you know, we have a tough issue in that we have to shake this market. Uh, Gene, this is a hundred year old industry. There's only three big guys, a, you know, globally, if you will, and the market is fragmented. So it's your classic oligopoly, right? There is uh, very little incentive for innovation. Um, and so the, you know, the, the maintenance practices and just the current industry culture is run until it breaks, right? Very little technology. And so we do have this challenge of having to shape that. What I am very excited about is that the, what the world has seen possible with artificial intelligence and what we've been able to do in creating a connected world where you and I can be on a call, you know, across the country, uh, having a conversation, uh, and then, you know, posting it onto a podcast somewhere, um, makes it so that, you know, uh, there could be some very neat disruption here that, you know, makes it, it, it really has that the, our customers primed. I believe everybody is certain that AI and IOT is going to save their bacon. They're not sure how, right. And they're waiting for, for companies and startups to, to, to show them how to do that and, and bring these solutions. So we did find that it's a huge problem. Everybody who's got a hydraulic system has issues with failure, maintenance, wear, and, you know, everybody's looking to maximize that uptime and eliminate the downtime as you, you mentioned. And so, um, I think, you know, uh, a, a lot of opportunity for us there in terms of getting that first. Yes. Now you have the prototype and you have those first adopters. And then you were saying you, you pretty much were working the networks at the same time to dust up the, the funding. So what was the next step as far as, um, pitching or, or pitch decks, presentation decks? Was the incubator helpful, uh, to you in creating the best presentation, uh, and letting you know when you're, you were ready to go out? and meet angels and, and go through that very formal process they expect of you being um, totally um, and fully aware of your business model to present to them? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's interesting to me because I, I believe the answer is you're never ready. And, and so what, uh, you know, when we got into the incubator, we did the three week program and we took a couple of courses uh, that were taught by Marco Thompson and Dave Titus. Dave Titus uh, was around in one of the founders of Silicon Valley Bank uh, back in the days. And uh, they taught how to raise uh, angel seed uh, funding. And uh, after that call, uh, you know, we, uh, we were kind of, you know, one of the favorites, I want to say, uh, of, of Marco. And so he had promised to open up his black book to me and give me a bunch of introductions. Uh, but first he said, I had to go pitch 25 of my own and find, you know, angels. And there was a big, you know, point in the class where who is an angel, right? Anybody can be an angel and, you know, they, they may not know it yet as long as they qualify and they believe in what you're doing. And so, I actually did my first pitch, a, a buddy of mine, uh, uh, set up a, uh, an angel group up in, in Utah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's up in Utah. And, uh, so my first pitch was the 16 season, you know, angel guys that had around and, uh, you know, kind of got to go through the ups and downs there. And it wasn't until I had raised, I think, 50 or 75 K of friends and family 
that Marco uh, made some introductions. And after that, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of downhill from there. He really got me to the right people. Um, but, you know, really getting ready, it, it was, we built our first pilot production with the first 80K that we raised. And so our, our first 75K uh, of, you know, angel, qualified age, I would say, uh, was uh, Andy Ballster, founder of GoFundMe, uh, wrote us a 75K check uh, just before the pandemic closed everything down. And that allowed us to build that pilot, gave us the steam and, and uh, you know, just kept learning from there and uh, ultimately went off to raise $3.5 million uh, in that first seed stage. So for our listeners, describe what you mean by, the, you know, the right you were with the right investors now. Um, wh- yeah. Why did you think their their money was important and their backgrounds or profiles were, were important to you? Yeah, well, it was for two reasons. First of all, the, the right investor understands what questions to ask. And so uh, one of the things that that lets you know you're with the right people are the ones that, you know, are working to help you articulate your vision, help you articulate the value proposition, help you, you know, understand how this thing scales. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, some of the best ones are the ones that have done it and are coming back to, to share what they've done. And one of the things that the Evo Nexus Incubator, the San Diego Community, the San Diego Angel Conference is a perfect example of that. Is that you know these are um, uh, people who are investing not just for the financial returns, but you know investing in the people and in the future. And so, um, what I really liked is you know these guys not only were willing to get up there and spar with me, right? And ask me the tough questions and allow me to work through it. Uh, but, you know, we're also there to kind of help me understand how to pitch it to the next one. And their validation really showed when, you know, they made an introduction to somebody else and who knew that you'd already gone through a Stephen Paisel or, you know, a Bill Cheney. And, you know, we're able to, you know, kind of expand on some of that stuff. Uh, really helps you not have to start from, you know, square one every single time. So you have the backing now, or you think you do. (laughs) Uh, Share a little bit about the due diligence and coming to an agreed upon valuation uh, with all the parties involved. Yeah, that was the, that was one of the most interesting parts. So, you know, startups are not very different than real estate, really, right? And and you go to San Francisco and you're gonna pay a million dollars for a 600, you know, square foot uh, studio. And, but at the same time, if you're a startup in Silicon Valley and you've got AI, IOT, it's uh, very easy to raise, or it was at least in, you know, 2020, 2019. Um, And so, but here in San Diego, it's um, it's not like that, right? The valuations are much uh, stricter. And so there was a challenge for me to read up on all of these big companies that I believed I was just as big, right? And see kind of what they were doing and then start out here at the incubator and, you know, kind of get the... Uh, the MSRP, if you will, the going, the going price for these things and understanding that. Um, but, you know, I quickly realized that one, if you are a disruptive tech and you're new, there is no price tag. And so when they gave me the range, I picked the highest one and then I worked really hard to defend that position. Um, but we raised our first uh, $800,000 on a $6 million cap. Uh, the, it was a convertible note. Uh, it had 20% discount and 5% interest on that. And um, with that money, we were able to actually build full 
uh, pilot, um, you know, deployable hardware and we deployed 50 trucks and we were able to validate, you know, our value proposition to the customer and the technology. And that enabled us to raise uh, a round um, on an $8 million valuation, uh, still convertible note uh, with a 20% discount. And, you know, I actually credit that to Marco Thompson. You know, he, he taught us about momentum and how important the first money in is and establishing a fear of missing out, right? And getting, getting kind of, getting the, uh, the fundamentals to that game, if you know what I mean. And so, you know, he, when we set out, we wanted to raise $2.8 million and we knew we could have a commercially deployable uh, setup for a few industries in a year and a half is what we had in our plan. And so um, Marco said, no, to split that and raise on a smaller valuation and get some momentum uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, raise the remaining of that. And that's exactly what we did. Now you have to remember, we started raising in 2020, just as COVID hit. So our first, uh, money came in January, February, I believe is Andy, uh, rose that check. And so, uh, money was drying up, right? People were you know, skeptical and, uh, the angel kind of, uh, uh, for a while, uh, seemed like it was going to be a, a tough situation there. And so, you know, the incubator was really proactive in prepping some of the companies. And so, you know, we, we decided to take the uh, strategy of splitting that round and being very efficient and, and uh, uh, getting to that valuation inflection point uh, pretty quickly, which we did eight months later. It sounds like, that you surrounded yourself with people of phenomenal experience to take you through, you know, some of these really tough hurdles that most startups, you know, face. Um, I mean, it, it sounds a lot like the the angel uh, culture out in the San Diego area um, is, is really hooked in to where the where the talent and where the opportunities are. Is that how you would? describe the San Diego area? Oh, absolutely. You know, a uh, uh, poster boy for that is, you know, Misty Rusk and the San Diego Angel Conference group, where, you know, you've got a, a you know, a fund, if you will, that, that spends half of the time educating the investors and bringing in angel investors and teaching them, you know, about the, the structures and the questions in how to vet these companies and how to do proper due diligence. And, and then the rest of the time they, they put together some of the best, you know, founders and the companies and they, you know, merge them together. And uh, for me, in terms of, you know, being a startup, if you're like me, at least, and, and you're out there, right. I, uh, I've never been a CEO, right. I, I've been an engineer and architect, the systems guy, um, and so, you know, kind of picking that up is you've got to understand and just accept that I've never done this before, but there's a lot of people out there that have, right. And there's a lot of different skills that I have to polish and I've got to get the practice. Right. And that's what I really, uh, appreciate about the San Diego, uh, angel community, the startup community here is that there are people that are willing to be part of the journey with you, right? And engage in it and sit down and listen to your pitch and, you know, tell you it sucks, you know, if, if, if it does and give you that opportunity to go make it a little bit better. Um, so, yeah. So for aspiring entrepreneurs seeking funding, um, so much of it is now, you know, driven by, you know, uh, online networking. We're supposed to be connected more than ever. It, it used to be entrepreneurs would be told that it would take them a year to find the right funding. Is that how long it took uh, you guys or the incubator and the conference, et cetera, et cetera? How much did it shorten or did it shorten? your amount of time of, of getting first, first money. 
Yeah, I know. Definitely. The, the incubator uh, that we were part of, uh, you know, had this rule where they said, look, it's going to take you three to nine months to, to close your round. Um, and, you know, and they told us that's conservative. Right. And I remember like laughing at that and thinking there's no way I'm going to, you know, take nine months to raise this money. I, I can spend that in three months, right? I need to deploy that capital, not, not spend the time raising it. And um, really though, when you get down to it, which shines a light on how important it is to be, to get a good investor is, you know, when you're doing it, if you, at least, you know, like, like I did it, I did it $25,000 at a time for my first 800 K, right? A uh, couple of big checks in there. And it wasn't until we had that, that we were able to, you know, engage with the funds. And, you know, we were, we had a great experience here. We we're syndicated by pretty much, you know, the, the San Diego, Southern California Angel Community, Pasadena the Angels, the co-fund invested, uh, Tech Coast Angels, and uh, both in Orange County and San Diego. And then the SDAC folks, they, uh, they came through big for us. And, once we had that money, right, and, and you're you're talking, you know, five different funds. You're talking, you know, seven to eleven different fund members that are interested in doing the due diligence and bringing it to the fund, right? And you're you're redoing, you know, due diligence, you know, data rooms because their format is a little bit different, and they want, you know, these copies, and so. There, there's an enormous amount of time spent in in that back and forth and really getting that discipline of having the calendar, having the tools, right? Like the HubSpot, et cetera. And can you keep track? We had pitched 160 investors by the time we had closed our 3.5 million. Um, and we had a total of 72 uh, investors, uh, on the notes, uh, uh, for that cash. So it was, um, it, it definitely takes, it takes the time, especially if you're doing the seed startup from a napkin sketch, right? Because you've got to go through those progressions and you got to be okay with that. You got to be okay with, you know, wondering when you're going to get your first 50 K because it only gets harder, right? The next one is how am I going to get the next 5 million and the next 10 million? So um, definitely my experience is that it, it is time consuming. It starts to get a little faster as, as you pick up the momentum. So once we had raised from the angel funds, uh, the angel uh, groups, uh, we had a couple of institutionals uh, that, you know, uh, came in and invested. So uh, Longley Capital and Okapi Ventures are both seed stage startup VCs here in the area. And um, I I got a half a million dollar investment from Longley over a, you know, cocktail entrepreneur event that the uh, Connect group was holding. So in San Diego, they've got the Connect, San Diego Connect, they've got the cool companies. We were a part of that. I went to the event. I met the guy. He said, Hey, somebody told me about you. And I said, you can invest, but you got to do it now. Right. Cause there's no way I'm spending another three months in due diligence. And, uh, a week later I had checked from him, um, that week, Okapi called me and said, Hey, Longley told me, you know, he's in on that. And, you know, I want to get in. So I told him you could write me a half a million dollar check, but you get one call and one lunch meeting with me, right? And you get to come down to the shop one time. So, um, you know, we raised a million dollars and over a couple of weekends there. Um, but, you know, uh, it took us six months to close our $5 million funding from Procon um, uh, earlier this year. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely... Uh, a journey and you've got to be prepared for that. Right. And, and just enjoy it and know that everybody's journey is different, but you know, you got to do the work and, and it does pick up if you're doing it right. When, when you said that uh, you pitched to 160 investors, was that an aggregate in the sense that you pitched to various angel groups and in total, 
there were 160 people who heard your pitch because I can imagine the efficiency of time if you had to, in the early t- in early part, personally solicit individual angels uh, one at a time. So was there a, a strategy of being you know, funded in one group who passed you to another group who then got you to the bigger money? Yeah. So, uh, the, we actually, so we had the first seed, right? We called it seed one, uh, $6 million cap. We raised 800,000 on that. Um, we had pitched to 40, we had raised from, I believe 41 investors at that time and had pitched individual pitches and investors about 116. And so the, after that, we went on to raise $2.7 million um, on, uh, and that took us up to about 160-ish to 170 pitches. And so all these were individual entries in the HubSpot. I know the number because, you know, we lived in that, in that world for a while. So yeah, those were individual meetings, going out, soliciting. Um, definitely the, the networking is the only way this is possible, right? So, uh, you know, part of the training is like, if that guy doesn't invest, he's got three other buddies who might, right? And if they don't invest, their three buddies might. And so, um, Every single pitch uh, that I did resulted in either an introduction to somebody else uh, or, you know, uh, an investment from them. And some of them, you know, Steve Pazel, for example, he was my, you know, maybe fourth Marco introduction and he said no. And he was the one of the last ones to write me a check on seed one because I keep calling him every three months to see if he had changed his mind. So he, uh, you know, he hung on and he was on the list as a maybe. I knew he was excited. I knew he was the right guy. I knew he understood the tech and he had done it before, right? So uh, I just kept following up with him and and, and now we're through. But yeah, the the networking going through, that, that helps pick it up. But those are individual you know, meetings, when, when you get an introduction, you know, it'll be an email and then you still have to go through that soliciting process of when can we meet, right? What, what, uh, and un, well, what is this guy like? And you got to go do your homework on him so that, you know, you can, you can be prepared and, and you learn how to, you know, how to position your pitch better. Were you ever challenged about um, the team that would need to be pulled together outside of your father and yourself once that money started to be drawn down? What was their expectation that it wasn't just the two of you and that you had the leadership uh, experience to to take this to the next step? Yeah, that's a great question. Our founders, our, our, our original co-founding team was my dad, myself, and Francis. Um, uh, the, what we made very clear, what we try, you know, what we used to raise this money on really, Gene, is that I am the industry expert, right? I've ordered every part, I've fixed the components, I've sold them, I prepared them. And so, um, there was a lot of confidence in us being able to deliver. Also, you know, we, we have a very, very strong technical background and have had the blessing of integrating some of the most complex, you know, kind of next gen technology uh, for some of the coolest companies out there. And so uh, we really made, you know, our living and fed our families from being the solutions guys. So we could build you an automated test stand and deploy it into medical device, you know, manufacturing, have it FDA certified in 28 days, right? And I know that because we did it for a big company here in San Diego. Um, and so we had the the technical skill set to get it done. Um, we were able to quickly get to the customer and show that we had a champion. And so they trusted that. And so, you know, they, uh, they were really excited about the fact that, hey, we've got a very efficient, you know, team that could actually deploy the capital to build build a thing, right? And so uh, there, we have a hardware-enabled SaaS platform. We've essentially created the industrial iPhone and plug-and-play sensor 
for all of industrial heavy equipment, right? And so um, most of our capital went into creating automated test systems and, you know, PCB designs and uh, developing the full stack. But there, there is a timeline for you. Uh, that was really going to be my next question is that you now have the commitment. You can draw it down. Uh, what is the expectation of the, the next few milestones? Because, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs get frustrated because they have to submit projections. And the projections, you know, the further you go out, you know, the less, less valuable they are. So there has to be some near-term milestones that lets the investors and yourself sleep at night. Um, so how does that go um, once you have the money and when, it, when are you telling them about your next big success that makes them feel good that they, they signed on? Yeah, great question. Um, so a lot of that, you know, one of the, I'll say traps, I'll call it a tribe genie, genie is that you, you realize that some of the investors have their model, right? They're going to go plug in all of your inputs and decide this is a good one. This is a bad one. Right. And, um, and then there's the, there's the U S that, cause really at the end of the day, if you're a seed stage, you know, early stage company, they're investing in you. Right. And so, um, one of the things that I, uh, struggled with is, you know, we were a SaaS company. The the recurring revenue of the, you know, actionable insight is very attractive in terms of valuation of the company, right? And scaling it and whatnot. Um, how and so that requires sales, right? And and getting getting your numbers up. And so if you get sales, your revenue comes up. And but there's other stuff there too, like well, what's your average revenue per that unit, right? What does it cost you to make that sale? And with the deep tech hardware that we had early on, um, we knew that, you know, we needed to get the cost down. We needed to get our scaling and manufacturing capabilities up so that we could bring the, uh, you know, sales friction down on getting uh, this deployed because we could offer a great monthly chart, monthly fee, uh, if we can make these these things inexpensive enough, very much like the cell phone model, right? You pay six hundred dollars and then hundred bucks a month, and now you have a payback period if you want to lease that to them or you know offshore that. So um, for us, you know, we tried to push on sales, and then I realized, oh man, these units cost me three thousand dollars every time I want to build one, and so sure I can go get a hundred thousand sales tomorrow. But I need to have the capital in there to build, you know, 100,000 of these units. And if my, you know, revenue prior, my, um, my recurring revenue is not big enough, then I have a longer term to hold that debt, right? So uh, what we did is we focused on the market penetration, the uh, shaping of that market, the validation of the industries and breaking out into, you know, the high, the, the high value industries, if you will, like mining, oil and gas. And so uh, what we've spent the last uh, few months doing is prepping the product for scaling this and, and getting these deployments. So uh, in uh, June of next year, I will be able to make 10,000 of these a month at $600 versus, you know, a $2,800 cost uh, that it does today. Um, and we've got enough in stock now with the expensive units, I'll call them, that, you know, we can enable all of our OEM partnerships this year that we have planned forward. So, um, you know, the milestones for us was uh, penetrating the market, right, and establishing the relationships with the OEM so that we could uh, get this deployed it, through those channels. Um, but also, you know, uh, 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 executing on our cost reduction so that if I want to go do, you know, every trash truck in the United States and put 110,000 of these out there in the next three years, I can do it without, you know, having to undertake an entire funding challenge, if you will. How often do you... 
report to your investors? Is it at the beginning, it's a lot and it, and it sort of smooths out or it's better because of the way that you've been introducing the product to the market it takes, a, takes a longer lead time. They understand they don't really need to hear from you for six months, but um, how do you handle that? The, the whole aspect of keeping them updated without feeling they're looking over your shoulder. Yeah, well, this is this is an interesting one because you have a lot of different you know paradigms here, if you will. So you've got an early investor who's a first time angel. He's never written any check. And he cut you twenty five k, right? And and he's watching crypto and he's watching Tesla and he doesn't get it yet, right? And and part of your job as an early investor is to be able to stand up in front of somebody and say. This is one you're going to hold for five years. Are you good with that? Right. And, and then you've got to go and tell them, Hey, I'm going to play to lose your money. Right. I'm going to swing for the fences because if I, you know, try to throttle this, you know, we just run out of gas. So I've got to really make the jump, if you will. So, you know, part of that is, you know, one of the lessons that you learned is there's a lot of fish out there. Right. And it's so easy to be desperate early on to try to take you know, the first money that that's offered to you. Um, but really it's finding good investors there, right? Now you get to be the angel funds or the groups where you have to understand there's a fund manager and he has a job, if you will, a responsibility to fill out a little report and send it to the rest of the investors so that he gets on the newsletter or whatnot, right? And so, um, you know, he's got a need Right. And so, you know, understanding what that is, you know, is, is, isn't, is another thing and, and what's the protocol there. Uh, and then finally, like your institutionals, right. And so who are very, very structured and have their quarterlies, et cetera. So one of the, um, the advice that we got early on was, you know, to share, share an update often. And interestingly enough, Gene, this is one of the advice that I, I respectfully declined. Uh, and I, I don't want to say I paid for it, but there was a cost to it. Right. And so, you know, uh, my investors would say, you know, uh, I didn't communicate often enough. Right. They would have liked it, uh, you know, every month and whatnot. And so I was doing quarterly and that quarterly was sometimes every four and a half months because, you know, uh, we were in the middle of trying to get hardware figured out because COVID shut everything down. Right. And so, um, you know, as an engineer, uh, I'm a math guy. I'm a logic guy. I'm not an English major, right. I'm not, uh, I, I struggle to write. I struggle to express my thoughts over email specifically. It's, uh, you know, the, the tone, the, the tense, the, you know, uh, uh, and so, uh, I just remember spending so much effort into providing an update and then not being good at doing an update. So I knew I was exposed to all of these secondary questions, maybe some good ones, maybe some bad ones. And before you know it, you're, you know, 80 hours in on emails and update time, right? And you have to remember this is still their cash. And so sometimes you got to make the call and say, I'm going to, you know, update you a little bit less and you're going to be mad for a little bit, but then you're going to be happy when you see what, what we did there. So yeah, that was, that was one of the tough ones for us. We try to stick to quarterly, um, but, you know, we did have times where I remember there was a whole quarter where I was not allowed to update my investors by direction of my board, right? Where I, I would come in and say, hey, guys, everybody's asking for updates. I've got to say something. And they'd tell me, you, you can't say anything, right? You're in the middle of, of locking down this deal. You don't even know if you have a deal. And this could just be a lot more time and you're deep in due diligence. So yeah, very interesting question. I think uh, it's, it's really up to what your investors, you know, what relationship you have with your investors. And I gotta say, G, one of the things I learned is you're in control of that, right? You're, 
you're responsible for your relationship with your investors, right? And you're responsible for sitting down with them, for talking to them and, and setting the expectations. You've been listening to the podcast series, Experience Voices, hosted by Jean Gray, publisher of American Entrepreneurship Today. Sign up for the series at AmericanEntrepreneurship.com forward slash podcasts.